All right, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Ali Kasiba. I'm an assistant professor of forestry at UVM Extension, so I'm the state extension forester. Um, and I really focus on climate change, uh, impacts to forests, and how that affects their health and physiology. So I'm going to be talking about sugar maple health or maple health in general, and I'll talk about some management um, that you all can consider using to sort of uh, factor in climate change and maple health in your uh, sugar bushes and your forests. So, you know, the biggest issue for maples right now is climate change because, as I'll show, climate change is going to interact with all the other stressors that maples face. So, this is sort of the overarching umbrella um, with which, you know, all these other processes and stressors interact. And so, this is true for maple, true for all of our other species too, but I'll talk about specifically. Um, how climate change um, affects maple trees. And we've seen in Vermont an increase in temperature and an increase in precipitation um, with climate change. And of course, you know, we can expect more changes, but a lot of that is uncertain at this point. But expect that these changes are here right now and, and probably more will come. So what does this mean for maple in particular? Well, one of the things we're seeing is actually a benefit to maple trees is a longer growing season. So these are data actually from here um, that Josh Hallman at the state of Vermont collects. And it's a length of time between leaf out in the spring and leaf senescence in the fall. So it's essentially a measure of how long these trees have to grow. And we're seeing that's increased about two weeks since the 90s. And so this means we're seeing trees often grow more. Um, they have more time to photosynthesize and store more sugar. So you could effectively see um, you know, more reserves and, and sap yields, potentially. So this is, can be a good thing for sugar maple um, physiology. However, you know, most of the other <laughs> impacts of climate change are not as positive. And one of the really uh, big issues for maple is winter temperatures. And we're seeing that Climate change is not altering the temperature regi regime equally throughout the year. Winters are warming quite a bit faster than other seasons, two and a half times faster. And that's, you know, really we're a hot spot in the Northeast and the Midwest for seeing those increases in winter temperature. And of course, the biggest thing that this affects is whether we have snow, how deep it is, how long it lasts. Um, and for sugar maple in particular, many of you know, it has very shallow feeder roots. And these are the roots that are scavenging nutrients, getting oxygen, getting water from the soil. And so these can actually be physically damaged when there isn't snow on the ground. So snow sort of acts as this insulative blanket on the soil. And so we've seen things, there's been research from places like Hubbard Brook um, here in Vermont as well that's looked at the impact of reduced snowpack and we see things like reduced sap yields. We see things like reduced growth, um, term length of uh, branch growth, diameter growth. So it can really affect the physiology of the trees. One year of this damage, really not a big deal. What we're concerned with is if this becomes a pattern um, for the trees. Um, and of course, then we get this other um, effect of snow is that it's a water source in the spring when the trees need that water. Um, and so what we're seeing is that stream flow, peak stream flow in the spring is happening earlier and earlier, but the trees might not leaf out at the same time depending on the temperature. So you can have a little bit of a mismatch there. Um, certainly with climate change, we think we might have just more wacky weather events. So we had one this year, actually did not affect sugar maple to my surprise. Uh, we had that big freeze event on May 18th. Um, but traditionally in other years, sugar maple has been the species most affected because it leafs out the earliest of our species. So really goes, you know, its strategy is to leaf out early um, and hedge its bets against a uh, spring frost. But sometimes that's not a great strategy. And these are all photos I took of different years of frost damage to sugar maple trees. And you can see they kind of create this deformed leaf shape. Um, the edges of the leaves are dead. Um, it might reflush a second set of leaves, which you can imagine is a big energy uh, use for the tree. Um, and generally, the leaves just won't be, won't be as big. And so that's the way that the tree is gaining, making carbohydrates and sap 
And so you can imagine a, fall, a year following a frost event, the tree might be a little bit more stressed. Um, I mentioned how climate change interacts with other stressors, and this is really important. We don't really know how this is going to play out, but of course sugar maple has a number of insect pests. Right? So spongy moth, um, fall webworm, number of leaf mites, this is, or galls, this is spindle gall, um, uh, sal prominent, uh, maple leaf cutter, and then sugar maple borer. There's more than this. Um, this is just some photos that I had of different um, sugar maple insects. And we think that with that longer growing season, warmer winters, some of these insects might benefit from those changes. So they might have more generations in a year. They might be able to grow bigger and therefore eat more um, leaves or um, wood. And so we don't really know how this is going to interact, but there's a lot of research looking into these interactions. And so, you know, sort of expect that these, these uh, relationships might um, change and that some of these insects might become more damaging. We also have uh, earthworms, and earthworms in particular really love sugar maple stands. Um, we have European earthworms. So all of our earthworms, you might have heard this, many of you know, are not native to our region. They were all wiped out when we had glaciers. So we have a few species of European worms, and those have been in a lot of our forests. I see them pretty far in the woods, um, and they are, yeah, been there for decades. We also have a new um, jumping worm, crazy snake worm, because it looks like a snake um, when it's agitated, and that I don't know that we've had any examples, I don't know if anybody knows here, of it being in the woods. It's certainly coming up in gardens and in, you know, people's lawns and sort of more developed areas. Um, both of, you know, all earthworms, what they do is they churn through organic matter very quickly. And the crazy snake worm does this even faster. And so generally these earthworms love sugar maple leaves. They're easy to digest compared to, you know, oak and beech. Um, they speed up decomposition. They can even, with their burrowing, they can, do, they can affect mycorrhizae. So those are those fungal connections between uh, tree roots that can help share nutrients. Um, it can cause uh, drying out of soils. So we could see an effect of climate change with sites that have earthworms um, that we might have more soil drying. Um, and there's a lot of concerns that these earthworms might affect regeneration of sugar maple. And as we see more rainfall, we are seeing it coming in heavy rainfall events. I'm sure this isn't a surprise to anybody recently. We've just had deluge after deluge. Um, but when we think about the forest, um, these rain events can have negative consequences. So they can actually wash out nutrients. You think about sugar maple, very nutrient uh, demanding species. And so that's a concern that we have. So some things like calcium and magnesium can be leached from the soil. Um, certainly they can erode soils and wash away that leaf litter that protects those fine feeder roots. Um, and of course, if you're thinking about your infrastructure in your sugar bush, you know, problem for roads and culverts and things like that. Yes. Yeah, that's what I saw in our sugar bush when I went out and looked. Is um, I wouldn't have thought it, but right down to the bare earth, and there's a pretty good layer of like leafy, duffy material there. And uh, I'd say four to six inches in a lot of areas just completely washed away. Yeah. Um, I've never seen the forest floor really look like that. Yeah, I've been walking around a lot since. I mean, there was different events that we've had in the past like month, and they've been in in different locations. Yeah, Certainly, you see that leaf litter. And that's actually a good, and I'll talk about when talking about management, that's actually a really good way to diagnose issues, is to walk out after a storm, see where that leaf litter moved, see where the water flowed. Can you, you know, move that water into a depression, a place where it's not going to gain velocity and cause more damage? Because what's happening is often that water then finds an old logging road or an old, you know, just shoots down the slope. Um, and when it's moving fast, it moves more, you know, more material. Um, when we think about warmer, wetter conditions, fungi love those, those uh, conditions. We're seeing that this year. Tons of mushrooms out in the woods. 
that's great if you forage for edibles, but it's also can mean things like foliar diseases. I think that's happening <laughs> this year. We're having a lot of foliar diseases like anthracnose um, could also mean things like more uh, decay fungi like armillaria, just a really, you know, benefit from those conditions. And even though this is sort of counterintuitive, even though we're having more rain, we think that we're going to have punctuated heavy rainfall events and then maybe periods of lack of rain. And one thing that's really important to know about climate change, when we have warmer air temperatures, that just means the, the air can hold more water. And that's sort of why we're seeing more heavy rain events. The air um, <laughs> can hold more water and then it hits mountain ranges and releases that stored water. Um, but it also means that it will suck the water from surfaces, that warmer air. So that means drier soils, uh, leaf surfaces, things like that. Um, and so, you know, this is most mature trees, even though sugar maple isn't very drought tolerant, they'll just shut down in periods of drought and, and hunker down. What we really worry about is the little regenerating trees, you know, not deep um, roots. And we've seen this, there's been a couple documented uh, examples that I found, uh, anecdotal examples of uh, sugar maple regeneration, more full uh, failure in years when we have punctuated drought. But of course it could, you know, it can definitely stress trees, cause lower growth, sap yields, things like that. Um, and, you know, we could see things like more ice events that can be problematic, again, for your infrastructure, um, you know, tubing, if we have uh, branches break, um, things like these, like heavy, wet uh, snow events that, that can be really problematic for saplings um, and wind events and things like that. So I want to talk about now looking at the broad Vermont landscape, you know, what are the projections for sugar maple in the future, understanding these stressors that sugar maple is facing. So we have, um, many of you are probably familiar with this, but the US Forest Service has this great tool you can go explore. It's called the Climate Change Tree Atlas. And so for all of the trees we have here in Vermont, including sugar maple, they project in the future how abundant will that species be? What will its habitat suitability be under a changing climate? And the way they do that is they use FIA data. So these are all locations of plots that have sugar maple in them. And they use this um, indice called importance value. And this is a combination of number of trees at that site and the size of the tree. So a higher importance value you get a, is, means you have lots of big trees at that site. And so the darker blue colors, and you can see Vermont, you know, we got a lot of dark blue there. Um, and then what they do is they take each one of these plots, put them on this graph of what is the average precipitation at that site and what's the average temperature. And this kind of shows this is what we call the climate space or the climate envelope for sugar maple. It's a range of conditions just based on rain and temperature that it grows in. And this sort of illustrates why we're concerned about certain species um, under climate change is this is the current, or this was the temperature in, in 1900, and this is the temperature in Vermont now. And you can see that, you know, we're, we've moved a little bit into, um, we're still solidly in that center of that range, um, but you can see if we continue to increase the temperature uh, here in Vermont, we get into these areas that have lower importance values. And that's certainly true um, for places that we look um, down more south of us that are seeing increases in temperature as well. And so the projections for sugar maple are actually a decline in importance value, but that's partially because we have so much sugar maple. But this uh, tool shows a pretty substantial decline uh, throughout our state in importance value. And that's really just a measure, again, of how suitable will the habitat be based on site factors? But you can see that we're still going to have, you know, pretty strong amount of sugar maple, um, particularly compared to the region. But places like northern Maine are projected to see an increase in habitat suitability. And it's really just based on that uh, climate envelope, that climate space that, that sugar maple occupies. 
But I just want to stress, sugar maple will not be lost from Vermont. I think that's a message that was conveyed. Um, and they're always updating this model. And so we do always get new information. We learn new things about how trees respond to climate change and what the major factors are. Um, and so, you know, it's not doom and gloom for sugar maple. And I'll talk about this in a little bit, but we will see the sugar maple in some locations, especially places that are maybe warmer, lower elevation, trees might be more stressed in continued climate change. And, you know, I, sugar maple is an amazing tree, as many of you know, and it has a lot of characteristics that can help it in a changing climate. Right? It's really well adapted to live long, so it has a lot of strategies like compartmentalization um, to ward off diseases and insects. Um, it's very strong wood, so hopefully it does well uh, in disturbances and ice loading. Um, it has a very large population and large genetic diversity, high genetic diversity, so that's really great. So we're not, you know, like I said, it's not going to be completely lost from the landscape, um, but there are some things that make sugar maple a little bit vulnerable. And that's, as I mentioned, the feeder roots, sort of a vulnerability of sugar maple compared to some other species, the early bud break um, and late spring frost. It does get eaten by quite a lot of insects uh, and diseases <laughs> are, are, can be, it can be susceptible to diseases. It does have very high nutrient demands. And so this can be a, an issue for it. And then when we think about punctuated events, it's really not a drought tolerant species. It's definitely not fire tolerant. Um, and hopefully we don't see a lot of fire in our state, but you never know. And then things like uh, low snowpack and really hot dry summers uh, mean that the tree will, will usually suffer. We'll see declines in growth um, and vigor in those events. And one thing that we're really worried about with sugar maple is regeneration. So we have this, we call regeneration bottleneck for sugar maple. We're seeing, we've got a lot of mature trees. We often, and we have a lot of regeneration, but the middle size classes are missing on a lot of sites for a number of reasons. Um, and some of these have to do with the physiology of the species, but also past management and of course stressors like deer brows. Deer love sugar maple seedlings. There could be this earthworm combination, um, but things like it doesn't seed every year. And seed viability we've seen from research is really dependent on the nutrient content of that site. So see, it might look like the tree has seeds, but those seeds aren't filled. They're not viable. We've seen uh, nutrient content uh, relate to how vigorous the seedlings are, how well they grow. So there's a lot of um, complicated factors between you know, a, a seed becoming a established sapling um, and tree. So, you know, of course, we love the sugar maple in our state, um, but I also really want to promote our other lesser maple our soft red maple, right, um, because of some of these climate change impacts. And so red maple is listed in that climate change tree atlas as our most adaptable tree um, of all of our species. It's really, I mean, think about it, it can grow in swamps, it can grow up um, almost the summit of Mount Mansfield, which is where I took this photo. The leaves look a little different because it has a lot of plasticity um, in how it will look. But that's growing almost at the summit of Mount Mansfield. That's a huge range. Um, it can grow on very nutrient poor sites, unlike sugar maple. And one thing, it's not a preferred species for a lot of the pests that affect sugar maple. It produces seed pretty much every year. Um, and I will say, you know, this is stuff that has happened here at Proctor Maple, looking at syrup yields and taste of red maple sap, really on par with sugar maple. Um, and I'm sure Mark's promoted this, but it's a really great video of Abby Vandenberg. Um, look, she does a, a research project to look at yields of, of red maple uh, and tastes of the syrup. So it might debunk some of the things we think about when we think about red maple. Oh, it doesn't taste as good or it doesn't have as much uh, high yields. Um, and they really looked at this over the course of a couple years. And so when we look at red maple doing that same exercise with the climate change tree atlas, first thing you can see is that this range of sites that red maple can grow is much bigger. 
It just has a much bigger climate envelope. Um, and when we look at the temperature back in the 1900s and now, we're getting into the solidly more blue area of its, of its climate envelope. Um, precipitation, as with sugar maple, isn't really a big driver. It's really that temperature, average temperature change. And so when we look at what's the projected change in this importance value here in Vermont, oh, I guess I don't have a thing there, we're seeing an increase um, in importance value of red maple. So that means that we could see it being more competitive. We could see um, the trees just uh, being more dominant in some of these sites. And so you can see that we're now on par with those same importance values of sugar maple, that red maple and sugar maple in a future climate might be very similar um, in Vermont. It's a little off topic, but yeah. why, why would be Michigan and Wisconsin be less here? For, yeah, for red maple. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, southern, southern New Hampshire and southern Maine are also seeing that. They just have more mild climates. I, I'm not a Midwestern forester. Like it <laughs> looks like it's out washy area, so it's like southern, it's the sandier. Oh, area. Yeah. yeah, so it might be site factors. Yeah, yep. Um, all right, so I wanted to talk to you about, you know, broad scale trends we can use from the forest inventory and analysis program. So this is a national program many of you are aware of um, that has plots throughout our state, throughout all states. It's a very coarse way to look at trends in forests, but it's helpful to think about long-term patterns because it can kind of pull out um, maybe some concerning trends or good tr trends, but these aren't meant to be specific to a site, right? So it's Vermont-wide, kind of gives us a big snapshot of what's going on with maple in our state. And so if we look at, these are just number of trees greater than five inches in diameter. Sugar maple is in this sort of yellowy bronze color, red maple in red. And what we see is that the number of maple trees has actually remained fairly steady. And again, these are very coarse assessments. We're talking millions of trees over here, but it gives us a sense of, A, what we have is you know, a lot more sugar maple than red maple. We sort of knew that. Um, and those trends are, are fairly steady through time, which is great. Oops, that was supposed to come up as a pop-up. But um, when we look at this by diameter size, um, so same color coding here, um, we see actually pretty similar numbers of trees or ratios of trees between the two species. Um, but really when we look at these larger size classes, as you can imagine, it's really dominated by sugar maple. And so that's a combination of us managing for sugar maple for many years and also a little bit of a factor of sugar maple is a more long-lived species compared to red maple, and so it's more likely to achieve those sizes. But we do have quite a lot of red maple in these sort of smaller to mid-sized classes, which if you think in the future, some of these are tappable, um, and there's quite a lot of trees um, of this other species that are tappable in the landscape. So yeah, well, that didn't work. Um, what we're seeing, and this is again a really coarse assessment of just average per tree growth of the two species, and we're seeing that increase over time. Again, this is probably a climate signal. We're seeing a longer growing season for these species. We also have more carbon dioxide in the air, and that does help trees be a lot more efficient in what they do and how they photosynthesize. So we're seeing an increase um, in that per tree growth. Pretty similar growth for the two species, which actually surprised me considering that there's more large sugar maple um, than, than red maple. Um, but that's, the, that's the, the statewide trend. When we look at saplings, so these are trees between one and five inches, um, fairly steady. Again, we have sort of that same gap that there's way more saplings of sugar maple um, than red maple. And so this is really great to see that we have, we do have a lot of saplings sugar maple on the, on the landscape, because those are going to be our future, our future trees. What is concerning is we're seeing a big decline in the number of seedlings in sugar maple. So these are trees less than an inch in diameter. And while red maple has been very steady over time, 
there's a pretty significant drop in the number of seedlings that we're observing at these plots. And again, this might, be, might not relate to one specific location. These are statewide patterns. Uh, about 1,400 plots we have, well, a little less than that, um, that are actually forested. Um, and so, you know, this, this points to something's going on. What is uh, affecting sugar maple regeneration to cause these declines? Luckily, we do have that good sapling class. Like I said, though, those will be the future trees, but we always want to be thinking about the future forest, um, and especially in, in, a, in light of climate change. All right, so I do want to talk about well, how do we incorporate all this information? It's a lot, right? We have climate change, we have all these other stressors. How do we manage our maple stands to incorporate um, some of these factors? So, you know, big take home messages, just again, because I think this really got drilled in people's heads like, we're not going to lose sugar maple from Vermont. But I think the take home here is that conditions are going to be more variable and they will be more stressful. And so having that in the back of your mind, how to sort of hedge your bets against variability, you know, uh, disturbance events, unexpected events um, will be really important. And so there are steps you can take, not only in your sugar bush, but you know, if you have a forest that you manage as well, obviously there's a lot of foresters here, um, to think about bolstering resilience. So the first of the, these steps are really thinking about, are there ways that I can minimize stressors in the stand? Um, and one of these is thinking about limiting damages to trees. You know, this is when you're, anytime you have equipment in the woods, making sure that you're thinking carefully about um, stem damages, but also root damages. And something we often don't think about, right? The underground, whatever's going underground. But roots extend a lot further than we often think, right? We, we usually think of, oh, the canopy, the root system mimics the size of the canopy. And that's not true. Roots are extending much, much further laterally um, than the canopy spread. And so you could be, you know, 50 feet away from a tree um, and thinking you're not damaging the roots, but there are likely roots there. Um, and so really thinking carefully about ways to minimize damage, damages. Um, you know, keeping healthy trees built to last. I'm sure this will be something Tony talks about, but really being selective and thinking about, especially near infrastructure, is this tree vulnerable to a disturbance event like a ice storm loading, wind storm, things like that. So thinking about stem architecture and branching, um, and that might help you think about how do you manage that stand. Um, maybe those are trees that you select for removal. I already mentioned that, minimizing root damage, but soil damages are really important. We are learning more and more about the importance of soils in forest health. And so being very strategic about when you go on soils with equipment and minimizing damages is really, really um, important. And if you see that a tree is, appears stressed, I think it's really critical to think about delaying um, Har uh, sap yield harvests on that, delaying tapping. Um, and so this might be uh, reducing the number of taps um, or just skipping that tree or a group of trees if they appear stressed. Um, you know, that tree is gonna have less sugar reserves um, and might be less likely to uh, recover from those sap extractions, right? So be able to compartmentalize, grow wood over that wound hole. Um, so this is really important to think about, you know, strategically um, assessing your trees for their stress. Um, adapting practices is really important, right? It's not just about adapting our forests. We need to adapt to these conditions. Um, so things like heavy precipitation events are gonna affect roads. Are there ways you can really think about concentrating roads, um, limiting your, your travel uh, outside of those road areas? So it concentrates impacts. Uh, avoid traveling on roads and wet. Wet soils compact way easier than dry soils. And so that means that you lose the air space in that soil. You lose the water. It really affects the ability of roots to grow into that compacted soil. So there's a lot of negative consequences of, of soil compaction. And you can't really get it back once it's compacted. You can't really pump air back in it. Um, so really avoiding that. I know that's really hard because if you think about when we're working in our maple stands, it's spring. 
um, and there's mud. So, you know, there are going to be times where you're going to have to travel in the woods when it's wet, but just try to limit it and be strategic about when you do it. Um, you know, don't do this, <laughs> which is a failed culvert. Um, make sure your culverts are large enough, uh, your drainage are large enough for these big events, right? And we talked about the recent event. If you see on your property that the recent uh, rain events have overwhelmed your culverts, have not, um, you've not been able to uh, contain the water where you want it to, that means that you need to upsize um, your systems. And instead of channelizing water, right, so it gains velocity as it comes down the slopes, we have this, fr this phrase, slow spread and sink, right? So the idea is keeping water in your woods where the trees need it. Are there ways you can sort of divert water off the traveled surface into depression, into areas where it has the time um, to be absorbed into the soil? Thinking about ways to maintain nutrients on your site. So one way is deadwood. Most of our forests have an insufficient amount of deadwood. Right, it looks a little messy, so historically we've burnt slash or we've cleaned up downed trees. We really want to think about leaving stuff where it is if it happens naturally, or even thinking about creating more of it. Because um, it does a lot of great work for us in the forest of holding water, cycling nutrients. Um, there's a lot of ecosystem processes that come with dead wood. Um, and we can actually use it strategically to protect regeneration from deer browse too. So that can help really benefit your sugar bush. Um, it can help control erosion and, and litter loss as well. Um, you know, I mentioned this too of, of impacts to wet muddy areas. There are things you can do. Corduroy is a great you know, technique using logs um, to lift your equipment off the traveled surface um, and certainly you know, more extensive things like bridges. Um, there are folks up in Quebec that are are exploring that have been exploring liming for quite a while and even in Hubbard Brook, New Hampshire, there's some long-term liming studies that I've worked on. Um, this, this has shown to increase growth of sugar maples, uh, increase their vigor, increase uh, seedling yields and success, um, and even things like sap, sap yields. Um, it really depends on your site. So before doing this, because it's expensive, time consuming, do some you know, reach out to folks, do a soil test in multiple locations. You know, it's really only a good idea in those places where it needs liming. Um, I got a question. I yeah. Yesterday, Mark was saying it was mostly about the calcium levels. Yes. So you're not necessarily trying to change the pH or change it too much. I mean, they usually go kind of hand in hand. They do go hand in hand. And but one ton per acre isn't necessarily going to change the pH. Too much, especially when you're saying that you're doing that once in 20 years. Yes. And so I'm just wondering, like, where, where, are they, where are they starting and where are they trying to get the calcium levels to? Right. So a big thing that why we don't, why we have some sites that are lacking calcium is because of decades of acid rain. And so usually they're using what they call pre-industrial levels of calcium. They're, that's their benchmark that they're attaining. So it depends on the, the amount of calcium in that site, but we have benchmarks of sort of what um, sufficient calcium levels are in a soil for are for sugar maple. And if you're below that, you might consider liming. Um, but really, that's what happened is the acid rain actually physically leached calcium, um, some other important nutrients like magnesium as well, um, from, the, from the soil. Um, and for sugar maple in particular, that was detrimental. I mean, it affects all trees and all parts of our forest ecosystems like snails were affected by it because they need calcium to make their shells. Um, but we saw that in some places like Hubbard Brook where there were, you know, they could document this acid rain effect when you added lime to the soil, it did um, promote these positive benefits. And it does last for, you don't, you only need to do one treatment and it lasts for a long time, but it's very hard to do and, and costly. Wait, so do you know what the, you know, what the parts per million they're looking for? Uh, I do. I, I do know that. I don't like right now pulling it out of my head. I don't. I couldn't tell you, but I. I it's out there. Yes, and I could get that to you if you. Yeah. Hubbard Brook. They were basically trying to bring back the calcium. So they were looking at what calcium levels were in like the 1950s or something, yeah. right? And so they. It was a pretty heavy amount. I forget exactly 
Yeah, there's some it, stuff. It was very, very heavy. And that one was actually not technically lime. It was the elastinite. Because they yes. weren't trying to change the pH. They were trying to look at just the calcium or silica in that as well. Yeah. Which, I don't know, trees were taking off the silica, but it was actually more just a calcium effect, not a change in a pH that would affect the other nutrients. Right. Yeah, so were they good. using gypsum instead of lime? No, it's elastinite. Yeah. Yeah. Which they also think the silica might have, it, yeah, <laughs> gets it. To, but there is some work in Quebec, and also there's another study at Hubbard Brook um, called the Newpert study that's nutrient perturbation study that, they, we, that was just Lyme. Um, but yes, there's a, a variety of different ways you could, you could get it. We, I mean, there's whether folks have done it in a sugar bush, a private sugar bush, I think there's less inf information, but certainly there are some research studies that I'm trying to get to how much would you put down? Um, I do have those uh, numbers. There are some, some studies from, from Quebec that I've looked at how much you need to put down and what the effect would be. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I know we oftentimes measure uh, nutrients in soils and extrapolate it to what's going on in the tree. Yeah. Are, are they doing any foliar analysis to actually look at what yes. the tree is able to uptake from yes. them? the soils yeah they do and it's actually you know it's a fairly large range that we see healthy sugar maples in for sort of calcium content and so what we're concerned is when you're below that uh, level and so we do see so they can um, looking at sites there's some sites that you can see are, are, are way below this threshold of what we consider a healthy sugar maple and you can ex they do have solar samples wood samples um, that show uptake of, of calcium and yes yeah. so while you're on soil one yeah. thing that sugar makers in the last five years have been periodically concerned about is manganese mm -hmm. because of the RO membranes um, and it mm -hmm. tends to be in drier years. I know we've ch I've chatted with Mark and Abby about it, but it, when you're sugaring, and, and it may be, it's probably more linked to higher concentrations of, of uh, but the manganese will, will basically foul your membranes. Interesting. Yeah. And you can clean that, but it takes a lot of time. Yeah. It takes several washes, um, which, is time you don't have, yeah. and but people have to deal with it because you lose performance. Yeah. And you've seen um, this past year wasn't bad, but the previous year was very bad for several for two weeks huh. on that sap. And how can you tell that it's there's magnesium? So if you're concentrating sap, yeah. um, you can see it um, in in the concentrate, oh, the yeah. flow meter. It'll almost look like iced tea huh. um, and um, I've seen pictures I haven't seen it I've seen where the permeate actually looked like cherry kool-aid huh. um, and, and it um, and the industry's figuring out some things to deal with it um, so actually what you have to do every time you process with an RO you got to wash and rinse, rinse, wash, rinse. Um, so when you have manganese, you do that rinse, wash, rinse, and then you do another wash with citric acid, which kind of um, essentially uh, opens the pores of the membranes and blows out the manganese. But then you gotta do another wash with regular soap to close those pores back up. Mm -hmm. So a wash typically takes two hours. So there's six hours. Right. You know. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so you're not seeing it be site specific. It will be vary by year at a site. Yeah. Interesting. And, and a couple of years ago, two years in a row, a lot of places had bad manganese. I mean, I think there would be some sort of, there's got to be a weather event. Well, it's like, like it's like, it's bad today, it's bad this week. Next week it's Oh, interesting. Fine. Okay, you so know, it's not seasonal. It, it's ephemeral, and so huh. it can be yeah. hard to set up an experiment. Yeah. To like yeah, so you don't know. It that. may so not even happen. So interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that so throughout different levels of concentration, or always at a certain level plus? I think it affects it if you're concentrating above 15, 15 yeah. Hmm. yeah. 
And a lot of people have also started going higher bricks in the last few right. years, but too, yeah. which is yeah. a complicating factor to this issue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And one of the things the RO, I was telling this to Will this year, but we, um, CDL, or one of the manufacturers, to, to in order to uh, prevent it, is do a rinse every two hours. Which and when you do a rinse, it it, it, it takes time because you got to right. you save the sugar that's in the concentrate, and it probably takes a half hour, you know, to to rinse it for 15 minutes. It takes maybe 10 minutes to get the sugar out of it, but you know when you add all those things on your day, yeah. your um, you're lengthening your day, but you're also not able to process that as timely right. as you want to. What, what soil types are highest in manganese? More acidic it seems like it's more... So less calcium, more acidic soils, you have more manganese. All right. That's where I want to... Yeah, yeah have to look at... Yeah. Right. Have you looked into like the literature in this? Huh. Interesting. Yeah, the first I've heard of it. I'm curious uh, what the physiology would be. Yeah. <laughs> I got a study site, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. All right. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, not cool, but interesting. There's many nutrients that are critical for trees, right? Nitrogen, also potassium. Um, and so what we were seeing with sugar maple is because of that acid rain, um, historical acid rain effect, that calcium and magnesium, but calcium most importantly, is really limiting in a lot of soils. Um, and that's caused a, lot, a number of physiological effects for this species. And you might have, for those of you who were around, like in the 80s, this was a big thing for sugar maple, like sugar maple decline. And, um, and that was really attributed to sort of like, you know, peak acid rain when enough of the effects of acid rain had really accumulated in the soils. Um, and so, yes, it's certainly other nutrients, but, but that's one that we know adding that in, we're seeing, a, you know, research has shown a, a pretty significant effect in places where there's insufficient calcium. So if you have sufficient calcium, it would be a waste of money to, to add that in because you wouldn't get that, that effect. Um, all right, so other practical steps, thinking about regeneration, and, you know, this is something that, um, you know, I recognize is, we talk about sugar bushes, you're, you're utilizing the mature trees, but really when we think about changing climate, having uh, multiple generations of trees in your stand is really a good insurance policy um, for disturbance events and, and other changes that come around. And thinking about multiple opportunities for creating that, uh, those opportunities for regeneration. So things like, of course, uh, reducing competition this can be a big thing if you have a lot of beech sprouting, as we saw in that other example. Um, Hay-scented fern can be a really big problem in sugar bushes, especially in historic ones where maybe there's really large sugar maples. I've seen this many a times, widely spaced because they were really focused on, you know, that's time when probably folks used buckets and it made sense to have focus on large sugar maples. And then there's just huge areas of hay-scented fern and, and nothing coming up. Um, and so you really are going to have to do in those conditions, do some scarification and do some, um, you know, more aggressive interventions um, to create opportunities for regeneration. And certainly, as I mentioned, deer love sugar maple. Um, and so that's been a really big issue and maybe why we're seeing that decline in sugar maple regeneration in the state. I would think it's a, a number of factors, um, but certainly many of us are out in the woods, you know, that sugar maple and, and deer go hand in hand. Um, but thinking about, um, you know, keeping good seed producers on your property um, is really important. That's the source of that next generation of seed um, and keeping a diversity of them. When we think about management, you know, what really works well um, based on research for, for sugar maple is releasing established regeneration, right? It's a very shade tolerant species. If you already have saplings in the understory, thinking about places where you can release those saplings. And so, you know, 10th to a uh, 20th of an acre openings um, to release those. You can also consider thinning between those or using crop tree release is a great option. Um, you know, you want to be 
not too aggressive because there is uh, implications for sort of wind throw and wind damage um, if you're opening things up too much, but really focusing on creating those, uh, that age diversity um, is really gonna benefit you. And so this is the you know, key thing in climate change. We want to think about diversifying. And this means a lot of different things. This means diversifying you know, what you're doing out in the woods and how you're doing it, diversifying the species. And we do know that when you have more non-sugar maple species, you actually reduce impacts from uh, insects um, and likely diseases. This, was, this paper came from, was just looking at pests of sugar maple. And if you had 25% non-sugar maple species, the impacts of the stand were a lot less. And it wasn't just impacts to the sugar maple, but when you have different species, they sort of act as breaks to allow that insect to move. You don't get those big population booms in insects. And so again, this is difficult because those non sugar maple trees might not be tappable. But if you're thinking about diversifying, maybe some of those eventually can be uh, saw logs, things like that. But it really does reduce the economic impacts uh, to your um, tappable trees. Things like age diversity. I know Tony's going to talk about this. I'm sure Stan complexity. It's this idea of insurance policy um, for unexpected events, right? And so we just want to have, we don't want everything to be in one basket. And we see this with a lot of historical sugar bushes. All the trees are large and sort of the same age class. And in some places, those trees are senescing. Right, they're sort of reaching like the ed end of their, you're getting infected with diseases and just sort of breaking apart and there's nothing in the understory um, to replace them. And so if you think about protecting your investment, your resource, that's not really a great strategy. Um, and particularly when we think about disturbance events, windstorms, things like that, having smaller age classes that can take over um, if you have something like that occur. And I really support retaining red maple <laughs> um, is really important. And that adds in that diversity. Remember I mentioned that red maple less likely to be impacted from many of the pests. And so that can be a really good strategy because you can tap it, plus it gives that, um, that diversity. Um, and so, and you know, the last thing is thinking about is, is monitoring. Um, and this is really critical too, because we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but thinking about ways to take note of changes. And usually sugar, maple, sugar makers are really good at this because they're noting um, yields and number of taps every year. So also take note of things you see in your stand, regeneration patterns, you know, when you have good uh, seedling yields uh, or failures, stressors and timing of those stressors. Um, outcomes of your management, what worked and didn't work. Um, and I saw on the, I love seeing on that uh, table using crown health as an indicator of stress. I use this a lot in my assessments. Um, and this is a great tool for sort of monitoring uh, vigor of your trees. And any one year you might see a decline in, in the, the, the health of a tree crown and it can recover, but seeing repeatedly year after year, ooh, that one sugar maple is really dying back, has dead branches, uh, doesn't look great. Uh, what we've seen from research is those trees, you know, are sort of on their way out. Um, photos can be a good way to, to monitor, too. Um, I think I'll sort of skip this in time, but, you know, I just have a summary here. Basically, the, the gist I think I've conveyed is we're going to have more unexpected events and really thinking about ways you can uh, build the resilience of your stand is really important for the health of your forest, but also you know, thinking about your investment in that property um, is really critical. Um, and I'll just plug, um, I do have a, a website that I've been building, uh, UVM Extension Forestry, and I'm trying to put a lot of resources on there, and there's a lot of climate change resources. And I saw on that um, guide, there's mention of carbon. If you're interested in carbon resources, I have a whole section on there. I will say that on um, October 18th, I'm hosting a sugar bush carbon walk with Vermont Maple Association uh, and Audubon Vermont. Uh, location TBD will be in the evening, um, but we're gonna be doing a, a sugar bush walk that's focused on carbon. Um, so if you're interested, that I'm sure we'll advertise or reach out to me um, if you wanna attend. All right, well, thank you. And
Yeah, if there are any other questions. Thanks, Allie. Um, 